So we are ready. Ah, so you got artichoke, which you may or may not want to grow in this area because of our summer temperatures, because they really thrive in the 75 degree uh, daytime temperature of about 45 to 50 at night. So it's considered more of a cool season crop, even though you know it's, it's going to set fruit and, and you're going to harvest it in the summertime. So it's one of those that for Middle Tennessee, you know, you might have luck with it, you might not. It might end up just being an ornamental plant for you. Um, it's in the same plant family as lettuce and sunflower and even just the common thistle uh, weeds that we deal with. You're typically going to start it from seed unless you've got somebody you can get a division from. Um, and you probably won't find it on the local seed racks. A lot of the typical, you know, mail order seed suppliers. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out: the uh, seedling leaves, the cotyledons, they call them. Um, they kind of look like a melon plant or something. When they, when I first seeded these and they started popping up, I thought, well, gosh, if I got some stray cantaloupe <laughs> seeds or something here, do you think that plant that's going to eventually have those big serrated leaves? I thought that uh, those seedling leaves were kind of unusual looking, so I, I wanted to show you that so you won't be, you won't wonder if you've got the right plant or not if you get some germinated. And like I say, if you get them to grow and you get them going, um, overwinter them so you don't have to try to grow them from seed again the next year. But what you want to do is uh, at the end of the season, at frost or right below or right before frost, just cut all the stalks off about 6 or 12 inches high and then just mulch it over real good. Put a thick layer of leaves or wood chips or a combination of that, something like that to really protect them uh, from the winter. A lot of people put even over that uh, like a floating roll cover or burlap or something just to hold that mulch in place so it doesn't blow away or something over the winter. You can even cover it with like a basket or a wood box or something like that. But typically, if you can get them protected like that, you can overwinter them. And, uh, and when it comes around springtime, you know, pull some of that mulch back and they'll, they'll hopefully pop back up. So again, you know, one that might be a little iffy. Um, I haven't tried cardoon yet. Cardoon is a relative of uh, artichoke. The difference being that uh, on cardoon, uh, they harvest the stalks and uh, you eat the stalk that it has a flavor similar to artichoke heart. And on, on the artichoke, you're um, harvesting, of course, the florets or the uh, flower bulb, whatever you want to call it, is the part that you eat on the, on the cardoon. It's sister, I guess we could call it. Uh, if, you, if you do those, you actually harvest the stalks. I'm going to try those sometime. I, I can't really tell you much about cardoon because I haven't tried it yet. Hey, hey Mark? Yeah. Uh, a lot of people grow uh, artichokes and cardoon just Yeah, they are they a real, a real yeah, a real pretty plant that, you know, yeah. that flower. Um, so yeah, that's a good point too. Very, very interesting foliage. Yeah. That's a good background. Yeah, that's a good point. Now beets. Um, a lot of people don't grow beets because they don't like them. <laughs> I like them, but something else you can do with beets um, is uh, grow the greens for your salad mixes. And uh, there's a lot of varieties or several varieties of beets that are recommended just for that. They don't even particularly make a great root, uh, but they'll grow them just specifically for salad mixes. Uh, beets are in the same uh, family as spinach and chard, so chances are if you like spinach and chard in your salad, you probably enjoy the beet greens as well. And it's a little different flavor, a little different texture, you know, kind of adds a little something new to your salad. Uh, beet seed is typically sold, you know, that 
it's kind of a large looking seed. It's actually a seed ball that contains usually two to four seeds inside that. So oftentimes if you're growing them from the root, if all, you know, two or three of them in that ball sprout, sometimes you have to thin them out. If you're harvesting them for your salad greens, often you don't have to thin those out because you're going to be plucking them. I call it a, a cut and come again crop, you know, like a lot of us do with your salad. When you're ready to harvest your salad for your uh, use at home, you know, don't go in there and pull out the whole plant. Just cut some off or, or pinch off what you need, and then you keep coming back to it. You know, you keep those salad plants uh, in the garden for a long time until the heat of summer gets them and not have to be planting so much. You can harvest off the same plant. And uh, I've got some lettuce plants right now that are just now starting to bolt and go to seed that I kept through, you know, all winter in a cold frame. So they've had a really long lifespan to them. You can do the same thing with bees. Now this is not the greatest picture. I just pulled these off the Johnny Seed website. A bull's blood and early wonder tall top are a couple of varieties that are real common to grow just for that purpose for making salad greens. I wouldn't necessarily let them get this far, though. These are like mature, you know, beets with roots on them. Generally, uh, you know, you're going to harvest your greens for your salad a lot smaller than that. They'll be a lot more tender. Uh, this was some pictures that also uh, stole off their website. Uh, they also uh, package the seed and sell them to people that are growing them for microgreens. So that gives you an idea there, and you've probably seen uh, some greens like that in some salad mixes that you bought at the grocery store and they were beet leaves and you didn't realize was in that salad mix but they'll slip them in on you too because a lot of times if they advertise they were beets people say well I don't want to eat beets you know because a lot of people used to can beets and they, they think they hate beets when they really don't if, if they had good ones you know but uh, so about that size or a little bit uh, larger is what you'll typically harvest um, for your salad meal. So you want to definitely try some beets uh, in that regard. And sometimes you can let them grow on and harvest the, the beet root itself. Like I say, sometimes you'll pinch off some of the greens that the root will never really make and you know just don't worry about it. Just harvest them for the greens uh, and enjoy that. That uh, Rubens was another variety uh, that they recommend. I, I grow that bull's blood a lot. I really like to add it to salads. Now here's a question for you. How can you have homegrown corn year-round without freezing or canning? I have grown that corn. A deck corn. And I I didn't have much luck with it, so that's why I'm here. <laughs> She's got the right answer. Grow you some grain corn, also known as field corn, dry corn. Some people, of course, call it Indian corn, or you'll even see it. I've seen some seed uh, on some of the local seed racks, and they'll have it labeled ornamental corn. And it's, it's the same thing. It's, uh, so you can, you can eat ornamental corn as long as, you know, assuming it's not been sprayed with anything. Um, all it is is mature corn that's dry. And um, once you dry the corn, you can store it virtually indefinitely. It's, it's a long-term storage crop, so you can, like I say, you can enjoy it all year, or you know, even a couple of years from now if you don't eat it all, you know, before it go, gets that old. And uh, you can grind it and make your own corn meal. So you can have your own totally homegrown cornbread or grits or polenta, whatever you want to make with it. Uh, and there's all kinds of varieties uh, that you can choose. This was one that got me started uh, growing this stuff. It was Floriani Red Flint. Um, I guess it was five or six years ago, there was an article that came out in the Mother Earth News magazine. And they were raving about Floriani Red Flint. It was a <coughs> Um, a corn that had, of course, somewhere in the 1600s had came from America and been taken to Italy, and over time, through selection and and uh, growing it there in Italy, it became a land race variety in Italy that 
they said, hey, this is a great corn. They brought it back to America, actually, from Italy. And uh, it's real delicious corn. Um, Oaxacan green uh, came out of Mexico. That's a good example of what she was talking about, a dent corn. On the dent corns, when they dry, the uh, kernel or the husk of the kernel is soft enough that as the moisture evaporates out of the kernel, it actually caves in, and that's what makes that dent in it when it dries. On the flint, what they call flint corns, you notice they stay round for the most part. They don't cave in like those dent corns. Also, the hoppy blue is an example of a flint corn. They have a harder shell on so it doesn't tend to collapse in and make that dent in. That's where the name came from as being hard as flint or hard as a rock, that, that outer kernel. So you have flint corns and dent corns and that's really the only difference is, is whether that kernel caves in or not when it dries. Um, these of course are handed down from uh, Native American peoples, the Hopi Indian tribes and the Cherokee people have white uh, corn that I've grown before that's also really delicious. Um, and there's others out there. Um, if you need a refresher or, or have never grown corn before, the uh, University of Tennessee has a good publication about growing sweet corn. And you grow your grain corn exactly the same way as, as any other corn. The only difference is instead of Hard, you know, your sweet corn, you want to harvest it just when the kernels are milky is, is when you try to catch it so it's, you know, peak sweetness and the kernels are still nice and soft. On your grain corn, you just let them grow to full maturity. And if your climate and your critter situation cooperates with you, you can let it uh, mature and dry in the field on the stalk. Now, typically, I don't do that because you'll either have squirrels and raccoons raid it or you'll get a, a you know, real heavy period of rain in the fall and a real muggy period and you'll start to have some of that mold in the field. So typically once it's mature, I'll just go ahead and harvest it and bring it on in somewhere in a garage or a room that you're not using spread it out and let it dry indoors uh, so the critters don't take it off from you. Just corn in general. Uh, just some highlights. It's a warm season crop. Typically, you don't sow your corn until after May 1st because you want to let the ground warm up some so the seeds will germinate well. Um, now, sometimes, like this April, we had a pretty hot, warm April, uh, and I got some of my corn started a little early. So, you know, you can play with that if the season cooperates. But uh, a lot of times you do need to wait a little bit, let your ground warm up a little bit. And uh, always plant your corn in, in groups or blocks. In other words, don't plant one big long row of corn. Uh, you know, instead of maybe having a 40 foot long row, make 10, uh, make four, you know, 10 foot long rows. You want it in blocks so that it pollinates easier. The, you know, the plants being closer to each other in a block like that they'll have a lot because uh, on your corn when it makes the tassel the pollen comes out of those tassels and it has to hit each of those silks uh, on the ear of corn and pollinate them if you've ever peeled back a, an ear of corn and, and you see just you know a few kernels there or you know holes where there's the kernels haven't developed that's where they haven't been pollinated so always put your corn in blocks like that so that it makes the pollination easier uh, if you're going to grow um, both a sweet corn and uh, one of these grain corns, you want to be sure and isolate them from each other so that they don't cross-pollinate and, you know, you get some kind of weird flavor combination or something that you don't want. And also, you want to be able to isolate them if you want to save your own seed. Now, you can isolate them either by time or by distance, and I'll show you. Uh, a picture on that here in a second and explain that a little more. Corn's known as a heavy feeder. You want to have a good fertile soil, but you can grow it organically. I don't use any chemical fertilizers uh, on my corn in the garden. So, you know, you definitely can grow it organically if you want to. Um, if you get a good dry spell when your corn's trying to, to grow and, and mature, you do want to uh, 
uh, keep it irrigated so you know be prepared to water it if you have to which in you know in a big field situation generally you're relying on the weather unless you've got total field irrigation but for us gardeners you know it's generally not a problem for us to, to water something in the garden if we need to now the other thing, and a lot of people when I start talking about corn, they either start tuning out or, or they come later and tell me, well, I just don't have the space to grow corn. Well, I grow just about all of my corn in four by eight foot beds. You don't have to grow corn. Um, you know, the typical spacing, when you read on the seed packet, they'll say, oh, space your rows, you know, 30 or 36 inches apart, you know, about three feet apart. And that recommendation is if you need to get in between it and work, you know, if, if you're uh, using a typical row garden where you're going to till between rows and things like that, then yeah, you do need that spacing to get in between the corn and be able to work it. But if you're doing raised beds, you can do the square foot gardening technique where you basically put one corn plant in each foot uh, so in a four by eight foot bed, you can have 32 corn plants um, there. And because it's in a tight space, you know, you, you're not going to try to get in there and walk through it or do anything in between. You can reach in from all sides. So that way you can do corn and, and have a good harvest in a small space like that. Um, now I'll talk to you about isolation. Here I've got some sweet corn, and this is actually a Floriani red flint. This is about half grown here. It usually gets up around eight or nine feet tall. It's a, a big, nice, pretty looking corn plant. Um, here I've got these isolated by time because this is a real early maturing uh, sweet corn, one of the fastest. I think it's about like a 60 day maturity. So it's going to come on and mature and be done really quick. So by the time this one shed its pollen, it's, it's done and gone long before this one comes up and shoots its tassels out and starts setting its pollen. So that way you just isolated them by time. In other words, this one's going to be done and gone and the pollen from it's not going to interfere with this one. Uh, if you can't do that, that time thing and, and you want to grow two different types of corn, then you just got to put them you know, 150 feet apart, or one on one side of the bar, and one on the other side of the bar, or whatever you can come up with uh, to isolate them. I always try to encourage people to put them a little corn plot in, you know, even if they've got a small garden. Now this uh, okra is not a uh, unusual crop to grow, but this is an unusual use uh, for okra. I've been reading, we're back during the Civil War when the South couldn't get, okra, uh, couldn't get coffee. Um, they experimented with a lot of different things as a coffee substitute. Chicory was one. Um, they would take the uh, seeds out of persimmon fruits and dry the seeds, roast them, and they tried to make a coffee substitute out of that. One that was fairly <coughs> successful, uh, and I found several references where people were bragging about them uh, back during the Civil War, was okra coffee. And um, interestingly enough, as I was reading about that, I came across in the, uh, a lot of y'all probably get the Baker Creek uh, seed catalog. They had seed from this gentleman in Panama, and that's what he grows his okra specifically for, is just to make coffee out of it. And they had some of his Abigail uh, coffee seed. Now, um, this particular one, I don't recommend that you grow here unless you only want to harvest it like in September or October. I found out, I thought, well, heck, that sounds interesting. I'll get some of this seed and try it just for the heck of it, you know. And um, so I planted it. The plants came up, looked beautiful. They just sat there all summer. Just, they never flowered. And I thought, well, what is going on? And uh, Long about the end of September, October, when the weather started to cool off some, they finally started flowering and they made some overs real late in the season. I thought, well, what in the world? You know, because I had some other okra and it was just doing its normal hot, loving the hot summer and going crazy thing. And uh, I thought, well, is it just me or whatever? And I, I got back on the site um, 
the second year and there were several reviews on there people had experienced the same thing they figured out there's something about they think it's something about the photosensitivity or something in other words this this particular variety is great for growing in south america but not here <laughs> so, so if you grow this one you'll be waiting a long time to get any pods off of it but you can do that with any with any over a variety and i actually found on uh, facebook uh, has kind of a standard uh, I sort of looked around some different sources, and that's kind of a standard uh, way. Basically, all you do to roast uh, your okra seed is, is get the mature seed off the plant. You don't want the seeds when they're white. You want to let them dry till they're kind of that, you know, okra seeds when they're dry, kind of have that dark green, kind of blackish color to them. And then you basically just put them in a skillet on medium heat and uh, heat them up and get the moisture out of them, basically all you're doing. You just kind of lightly roast them, and then you can stick them in a coffee grinder and grind them up and brew them up. And now I won't, uh, I won't swear to you, I also found out doing some of this research that back in the 1800s, um, a lot of the newspapers weren't really that particular about verifying stories, and they weren't that particular about copyright or, or copying each other. If they saw something that was interesting like out of a Philadelphia newspaper, they might reprint that same story, just reword it a little bit all over the country without crediting the first guy and without really checking to even see whether it was true or not. So I wouldn't tell you that okra coffee tastes exactly like uh, Java or coffee, but it is a really good Taste. To me, the flavor is a little more fruity and a little more earthy, maybe, than, than regular coffee. It, I mean, it definitely warm you up on a cold winter day. Now, it doesn't have caffeine, so if you want a caffeine-free uh, <coughs> coffee substitute, and also probably another reason that it never caught on, because you know, most people want coffee for the caffeine. But something interesting you can do with, with okra if you want to. Now here's one peanut, and there's actually a Tennessee red uh, peanut variety. This is a, a seed that I got uh, from Baker Creek uh, also. It's a, a pre-1930s heirloom. It's a Valencia type, uh, which according to Arkansas uh, University Extension, Valencia is the best variety for home and gardens. So as home and gardeners, we're in luck if, if we grow Tennessee red peanut, because that's supposed to be the easiest farm to grow. And you can boil them, roast them. Um, there's actually four different types of peanuts, and uh, I put that in there just so you, you'd have it. And by the way, um, I'll go back to the front there at the beginning. I'll give you all my email address. Anybody that wants a copy of this, if you want a copy of any of this stuff, uh, I'll give you my email. You can just shoot me an email, and uh, I'll send you a PDF. So if you want these slides for, for future reference, you're welcome to them. Um, neat thing about uh, peanut plants is they're legumes, um, so they fix nitrogen. So even if you're not that crazy about maybe having peanuts to eat, which I enjoy eating them, but uh, I know some people, you know, maybe could give or take them. You might even consider growing them as a cover crop, uh, just to add some nitrogen or green manure to the garden. Um, these are the very young plants here. I wanted to show you kind of what they look like uh, shortly after they emerge. And you see they have kind of a, a almost pea-like foliage that make a really lush green uh, Foliage, like I say, you get a lot of good green manure if you're looking for that type of thing to turn into your garden soil. Um, but uh, you want, kind of like corn, you want to let your soil get good and warm. Uh, so typically sow them after May 1st or so, uh, about one to two inches deep. You want to end up with each plant spaced about four to six inches apart. Um, and on that particular one, the Tennessee red, um, when they sell you the peanuts, they just come the whole peanut, you know, in, they're still, uh, the individual nuts are, are still inside the, the shell. And so right before you plant them, just pop open the, the shell and, and take the individual peanuts out. And they say not to disturb, not to peel off or disturb that red membrane. Just leave that on there and stick them in the ground. 
And uh, that's something what they'll look like when you harvest them. And I, I probably should have put a little bit bigger picture, but they get a good, you know, I don't know, 18 inches, two feet high, they kind of start, you know, flopping over at, at some point. But you do get, again, a lot of real lush uh, growth out of them. You want a good, nice, loose soil to grow them in. Is what they do, the plants flower, and then there's like a little shoot or stem that comes out of those flowers and goes back down into the soil, and that's where the, the peanuts form um, is off of that little shoot or runner. Uh, that goes down into the soil. Um, now the Valencia is a fairly quick maturing peanut compared to some. Um, some of the like extension materials uh, that you'll find on the internet about growing peanuts is a little more um, suited to like the commercial growers and a lot of the commercial growers uh, will let the plants grow until the frost killed and then they'll turn them up and harvest them after frost. Uh, these, they'll probably be done and really ready to harvest before the actual frost, so you can dig them up sooner than that if you want to, and, and I might recommend that because if you dig them up after frost, then you have to be careful that you don't have a hard <coughs> frost or something. Uh, basically what they recommend in the commercial growers, they dig them up and then they let them sit there above ground for three or four days and kind of dry out until they come back through and collect them. But they even they have to be careful doing that because if a real hard frost hits while they're laying there on top of the ground drying out, it can actually damage uh, the kernels in the nuts. So instead of dealing with all that, I say just get them out of the ground a little bit before frost. There's actually a really good page um, if you go to uh, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, which is another good seed source, and I mentioned Baker Creek, uh, but that's another one that's really good. They have a, a page on their website called Growing Peanuts at Home that's really good, has a lot of good information, and uh, they even tell you how to make peanut butter at home and how to roast peanuts and how to boil peanuts. It's real thorough, uh, not only how to grow them, but things you can do with them as well. Now this is kind of an unusual one that's fun to grow. It's an edible pod radish. Probably has one of the worst, most unappealing names in the world. They call it rat's tail radish. <laughs> I hate that name, but it's, it's a very neat uh, crop. All that is above ground, and I'll show you some more pictures of these pods. So it's not a radish root. Uh, that grows in the ground, but it has that, that crisp kind of body, sort of radishy flavor. Uh, you can add it fresh in salads, you can put it in stir fries, you can pickle it. I'm going to try that this year. I never got around to pickling any last year. I think it would probably taste really good pickled, so I'm going to try to get that done this year. Baker Creek uh, reported that it was grown in the U.S. as early as 1860. And uh, the seed that they have is actually an Asian heirloom that they collected from Thailand. So this is what the plant uh, looks like when it's, I don't know, maybe a third grown or what have you. It's, it actually hadn't started to flower yet. And as it gets a little bit bigger, the, they are probably not as large as they look in these pictures because I wanted to give you a close-up. They're kind of a little dainty little flower. But I mean, that plant just gets covered in these little white, purple-white flowers. It's really nice, kind of like Floyd mentioned on the artichokes, a nice little ornamental plant uh, as well. And then eventually, all those flowers turn into just hundreds of those pods. I mean, those things are just loaded. Um, so I think probably one, I mean, you probably want to plant at least two plants in, in case something happens to one of them. But, one plant will probably give you more of them than you can keep eating. And um, chickens like them. I ended up feeding quite a bit of them to my chickens. I, I let some of them just go and dry out. And then once they get good and dry, you can just kind of shatter them and the chickens will pick the little seeds out of them. I brought some, for anybody that wants it, I don't have an unlimited supply, but I brought some seed for the uh, 
Tennessee red peanuts, and I also have some seed for the Floriani red flint corn. So anybody that, that wants any of that to try, you're welcome to. Um, and then finally, not an unusual plant at all, uh, but I figured we'd talk peppers here for a second. Um, one of my favorite things to do is to overwinter uh, pepper plants. And you can take virtually any pepper plant that you're fond of that, that's done particularly well in your garden that summer and uh, dig it up and stick it in a pot and bring it inside and you want to have you know a decent sunny location a nice you know sunny window to put it in something sort of sort of south facing this window that, that I've got is, is kind of more west it's not ideal uh, but they get enough light there and um, couple things I do. One, I, I, I get the plants, of course you want to get them before before frost, so I try to, you know, get in there if I know frost is coming pretty soon in the next week or two, I try to get out there and dig up a couple of pepper plants before the frost hits them. And a lot of times I'll bring them in just still loaded down with fruit. So I mean you can use them for fresh storage. You can bring them in the house with still fruits on them and you know, over the next few weeks, you know, be harvesting fresh peppers uh, right off of them. Now, if you can keep them warm enough and they get enough light on them, a lot of times, like this one did, uh, you'll get blossoms and fruits on the plant inside during the winter. This is snow on the ground back here, and you can see this plant, this is a close-up, it's just loaded with blossoms. This is a, a purple jalapeno. Uh, plant that's been one of my favorites for the last few years and I think this is the third I just just a few days ago took it out of the house and put it back in the garden and I think this is going to be its third year uh, in the garden and uh, it set a bunch of fruit uh, like in February and March and we were just you know, uh, I've got some uh, chickens at the house and you know, we like to get those eggs and make omelets, you know, every morning I'm in there cutting up fresh peppers, you know, right off of those plants. So it's great to, to overwinter some pepper plant. And one trick that I found is I always water them with warm water. Um, if you got them. <laughs> yeah, because peppers, tomatoes, all those kind of plants, you know, they like warm soil, so don't get that cold tap water and water them when you water them inside, water them with warm water and that really helps keep them happier because um, then they don't have to fight off that cold from the cold water. And if you've got a tap, you know, that, that heats up pretty quick, you can water them with just, you know, the hotter warm water after your sink. Um, or if that's too inefficient, if yours takes too long to heat up, I just take a bowl and put it in the microwave way and warm it up a little bit and then water the plants with that. And uh, I wanted to give you an idea, these are not the greatest pictures, but uh, I just use a standard like terracotta pot. Uh, when I dig them up, I think that's like a 14 inch pot, I think it's what they call that. And this was the other day when I just carried them out to stick them back in the garden. And you can see the plants are kind of yeah, a little bit scraggly and what have you, where they've been inside and they haven't been getting ideal sunlight and they don't have a whole lot of soil to stretch out in, you know, so it's definitely not ideal conditions for them. But um, you see, this is a close-up of this plant here and it's still got, you know, fruits on it. It's got mature, you know, red ripe fruits on it uh, right now that I'm still eating. So, And once you get this back in the ground out in the garden, you know, it'll just explode and fill back out and, and just be a beautiful plant in, in no time at all. And now that doesn't always work. I've had some that I've brought in, you know, that, that don't make it. They're not that happy being inside and they die off. But typically, typically it works pretty well. Have you tried it with sweet peppers? Yeah, uh, actually this one is a uh, Cubanelle, kind of an Italian sweet. And um, I actually ended up with, with two plants stuck in that pot. I just kind of pruned them back a little bit because it it does seem to be a lot of times a little easier to do with hot peppers, but you can do it with sweet peppers. Seems like any of the ones that I've had die off in the past. I've had one or two plants that 
that they throw the wind. They, they, a lot of times they are the sweet peppers, but, uh, but yeah, it does work the sweet peppers as well. Do you find that your sweet peppers and your hot peppers uh, cross with have plant close together? I had sweet peppers that had a little tang to them. Yeah, a little right? heat to them. Yeah. <laughs> they can, yeah. I've had that from time to time. Um, not too bad, but yeah, they can cross like that sometimes. And then uh, the last thing I'll just say in, in closing, just in general, I always encourage people, especially if you're new or newer to gardening, is grow something you don't like. Because <laughs> a lot of us, you know, if you've only had it from the grocery store, especially out of a can, uh, you know, a lot of us haven't experienced what vegetables really taste like. So, you know, every year pick something that you don't think you like and grow it in your garden and try it because it's usually a night and day difference in flavor between something that's truly fresh and something that's been grown, you know, with your love than, you know, a lot of things that you've maybe had uh, from the store. Because nothing against stores. I use stores too, but, you know, they can only get it to you so fresh, you know. It wasn't picked a minute ago like you can pick it, you know. It was picked at least hours or days or sometimes even weeks ago. And, you know, worst yet is, you know, like I was talking about beets, you know, if all you ever had was those beets out of a can at the holidays, you know, then you really haven't had beets. So, you know, if you think you don't like something, grow it at home and try it. Any questions, anybody, on any of that stuff? I have one. Yeah. Do you have any tips on growing beets from seed? Because I can't do it to save my life. <laughs> you have to have a raised bed. I have a raised bed. <laughs> have a raised bed. <laughs> Are you just, is it problems with getting them to germinate? Um, they'll, they'll germinate. And I'll, well, not even, I'm even having trouble with that. Um, I've tried soaking them. I've tried not soaking them. And then I'll get a few that will germinate, and then they'll die. And I've tried my raised bed. I've tried, I've had the most success just in a pot. And I got three beets. <laughs> and that's it. Well, I don't know. Now, of course, you know, make sure you have fresh seed. That's, that is important. Sometimes, you know, I've had things fail, and it's just because, you know, I let the seed get too old, and, and you know, I really should have ordered some fresh seed for it. Um, I don't, know, I don't know, just, you know, bake. be sure to keep it moist when you're trying to keep get it to germinate. Um, I don't know, anybody else got any beet? Have you had the soil test? Uh, I'm in the process of getting that done. Okay. Yeah. That's, a good, that's a good start, aren't we? I was going to say, are you planting in a raised bed or are you planting anything else in there besides the beets and how effective? Oh, everything else has been great. In the same bed? In the same bed. Oh. Just not the beets. I think my best beats I started in the fall and the winter. I may I may try that this year. I may try that this year. And you might uh, you know you might be able to get some to germinate indoors and then transplant them. Yeah. And I know I got it from Baker Creek, so I know it's good seed. It should be, yeah. I just keep yeah. trying. That's what I do when I mess up, just keep trying. I have a question. Yeah. I want onions sets in March and didn't get them in. We had a wedding in the family and I didn't, my gardening got postponed. So can I put them in now? Mm -hmm. I would, yeah. Some stagger those and have them all year long. Yeah. Plant them every two weeks. Yeah, okay. Oh, onion, onions can be pretty resilient and sometimes they can look pretty rough and you stick them in the ground and they'll still get going. And another trick you can do on onions, um, like when you go to co-op or wherever, you know, and, and get, right your, get your sets in the spring, you know, and stick those out and grow them maturity and you harvest them. You know, always stick some on the shelf. And, you know, a lot of the varieties um, that you grow in the sets, they're not really storage varieties, but yes. you can generally store them a little while. And um, a lot of times I'll have some, you know, on the shelf there or what have you. And, they'll get too far gone and they'll start sprouting. Well, you can take those out and stick those in the ground and overwinter them and that'll be an early onion a lot of times next spring. 
And uh, so a lot of times, instead of just letting them kind of sit there and rot down, you know, I'll just take those out and stick them in the ground. And, you, know, you can get some real good early onions sometimes that way. Thanks. A, a person gave me a, a bag of onions and said, you know, I'll take them out and put them real thick turn them into sets. The sets you have to tell the next spring. Who do you see the growth of the seed? I was shocked. What? Onions. Oh yeah. Yeah. Don't know. <laughs> <laughs>